Our final innovative talk will be given by Dr. Gilad Litvin, Chairman, Chief Medical Officer, and Founder of Corneat Vision. He will present his work on a new, completely synthetic keratoprosthesis. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Ed and the committee for this invitation. It's a privilege uh, to speak before you today. Um, these are my financial disclosures, and they are pertinent as uh, I am the inventor and deeply involved in the development of the Corneat Capro, so take my things with a grain of salt. Um, this is our first Capro implantee, Jamal. He's a 78-year-old uh, male. He has one functional eye, and that eye underwent four previous corneal transplantations, the last one about a decade ago, culminating in a cantamoeba infection, and this is pre-op on the table. We'll come back to Jamal. This is a device, this is the Corneat Capro. As you can see, it has two uh, members, an optical component and a nanofabric integrating skirt, and a rim that fuses both of these uh, elements together. Now you can see the device, it comes in a protective casing. The rim has three pairs of suturing holes, four bays for future access into the AC in case you need to perform uh, surgeries, and grooves filled with a nanofabric to integrate the PMMA itself to the eye wall. A posterior undercut to house the remnant cornea and flanges that assist the surgeon in inserting the, uh, the cornea intraoperatively into that undercut. The nanofabric skirt is manufactured by electrospinning technology, and this technology uh, allows us to create a non-woven matrix in the nanometer and micrometer scale. And you can see uh, our ECM, uh, artificial ECM, with a strand of hair over it, and on the right-hand side, our Tenon's capsule collagen network, and you can see the similarities. Another differentiator is the fact that we anchor the device instead of in the corneal tissue, like previous uh, models, uh, a tissue that's devoid of blood vessels and has no, uh, very few cells, we anchor the device in the subconjunctival space, an area that heals vigorously. In order to test our assumptions, we shortlisted four configurations of this uh, nanofabric and blinded ourselves to the configurations and tried initially uh, to test them in vitro with human cells, with human fibroblasts, and afterwards uh, validated our assumptions in vivo in a rabbit and eventually uh, found the winner that uh, performed the best. That paved the way for extensive biocompatibility testing and an animal trial that was recently, recently published in Cornea, you can see here, uh, where we followed up eight rabbits for six months. And this is the main finding of our animal trial. You can see the H and E slide on the left with abundant uh, cell nuclei interspersed between the fibrils of the nanofabric skirt. And on the right-hand side with Mason trichrome, you can see collagen in purple and even a capillary coursing its way from one end of the skirt to the other. And this is again Jamal. I would like to thank Professor Ririt Bahal for sharing this surgical video of the first in human ever implantation. So this, the procedure starts with a 360 degree pyritomy, followed by uh, epithelial debridement to avoid downgrowth, and then marking the center of the cornea. This is crucial to center the procedure on one central mark. You see Professor Bahal staining a marker tool and then stamping the eye, showing the surgeon where to lay the sutures, where the paracynthesis should be, and also the trephination's edge for a good visualization under the implant. Then she fills the eye with viscoelastic and starts placing the sutures first through the device and then through the corneal sclera where it is indicated. After the three safety sutures are positioned, she goes on to trephine the eye she centers the trephine's crosshair again on that initial central mark, so the trephination will be centered on the undercut of the implant. After doing so, all that is uh, left is to pull on the distal, distal end of the sutures and approximate the device to the eye wall, sealing the eye and uh, 
uh, stopping the uh, open sky segment of this procedure. After tying the suture, using a dedicated spatula called a snapper, she inserts the corneal remnant into the undercut, after which all that is left is to reposition the conjunctiva, suture it in place, and using T-seal, uh, complete the procedure. You can see here in the rabbit, one month post-op, barely any inflammatory cell reaction, two months already cells uh, have invaded into the matrix, and six months you have already seen uh, complete collagenation of the skirt material. You can also see the anterior segment OCT of our patient with four months post-op and the bottom picture showing the optic element in good positioning in the anterior segment, and the top hand picture you can see the skirt overlaid with the tenon and then the conjunctiva. To summarize our uh, first in human experience, so far we have two implantees, Jamal, that you see on the top, he's almost seven months post-op. He has a bad optical nerve, but still he sees six over 90, he's very, very uh, pleased. He hasn't been able to uh, see for a decade, as I was saying. And the second patient is an OCP patient who hasn't seen for 30 years. He's now three months post-op, and his vision is uh, 20, uh, six over nine. Um, the only thing that I want to uh, uh, mention is that both have shown uh, some conjunctival retraction initially in the first few weeks that stopped once the tissue adhered to the skirt material and has been stable since. I think the conclusion, though, from my talk is not uh, the artificial cornea, but the ability to integrate artificial, mechanical, and other uh, components into our human body seamlessly uh, with this uh, te technology, with the, uh, this uh, polymer uh, uh, ability, uh, and I think it ushers away uh, to a new uh, era of medical devices. I'd like to thank Professor Irit Bachal for being bold and performing this first in human implantation and being generous with her materials, and my team of 15, uh, led by uh, Mr. Al Mughale Raz, Cornet CEO. Uh, bo bo all of them are very diligent and professional. I'd like to thank them, and thank you. Thank you, very good. Ike, you've had some experience using this material in, in glaucoma surgery. Can you talk about it? Yes, I, I had the privilege of being the first in the world to use the material, um, as it, you know, biointerrogates very well. It's a good, useful material to cover implants, for example, tube shunts. Uh, so far in our results, we've had excellent results. It's well tolerated. It's at a low profile. And, uh, you know, the biointegration, I think, is a real valuable asset. So in the glaucoma world, we've certainly seen, you know, potential benefit here. Do you, have any, do you have any sense that the, you have to have tenons available to make the integration of the capillaries? Like, it, you know, because these patients are often, they have very sick eyes and maybe not have as much tenons. I, um, I see the big difference between the rabbit trial and these initial patients. It's true. When you try and uh, implant these in healthy young rabbits and you only lift the conjunctiva and the sclera is still with tenon, it's much simpler and it heals much better. These eyes are very scarred and the tenon and conj are fused together, so retraction is partly due to the tenon being retracted. And we're working on ways, perhaps uh, we're thinking of uh, doing Botox for the initial month in the extraocular muscles. These are only uh, single-eyed patients uh, usually to uh, avoid the movement because that might assist in the, or cause the retraction and perhaps doing a relaxing incision only on the conjunctiva posteriorly in the fornix mm -hmm. to allow mobility of the conjunctiva and lessen um, the tension. But it is a challenge, it is the challenge that we are facing now. Uh, but what we do see, and we saw in the rabbits, that even in areas where there is retraction, the skirt is filled with collagen and with fibroblasts and even capillaries, even in areas that the conj is not covering it and there is no access into the interior chamber, and this has been true for Jamal, seven months post-op, the, the rim, about one and a half millimeter, is not covered with conch, but his AC is quiet, uh, and it doesn't seem like it's uh, bothering him, and we can, cannot, of course, do any pathology to make sure that uh, this uh, skirt material in humans is full of uh, cells and collagen, but we presume so. Well, great work. I mean, obviously with these K-Pros, uh, tissue integration has been the main problem. 
with a lot of these, we get extrusion, we get uh, infections. I was wondering in terms of the intraocular pressure issue with these capros and do you have now maybe a system, I heard Ike talking about another device where you're combining the two to maybe uh, address that portion? So we're working on Capro 2.0 and we've uh, contacted a Canadian company called FISO. They do a fibro optic uh, measuring uh, sensor for pressure where we, you can embed it in the internal uh, aspect of the PMMA lens and with light and a membrane, you can gauge the pressure internally. Currently what we do uh, is we uh, follow them with digital palpation and every three months we do a serial uh, OCT of the RNFL to make sure that nothing happens. And also since for the first time this is a very wide aperture lens, the optical uh, element is, uh, optical zone is 6.5 millimeters, we can also have the patient perform a visual field so we can accept for the pressure, follow up a glaucoma pre uh, patient like we would have otherwise, uh, clinically. And this is our solution now. Hopefully we will have in the next generation also an embedded pressure sensor. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Lipton. Very good work. Thank you very much. <clears throat>